<clears throat> hello, 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 everybody. <laughs> Greetings and welcome to Crack and Krakoa. I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor in chief of comicbookherald.com. I am joined today by writer Cy Spurrier. Incredibly excited to be joined by Cy to talk all things Way of X, his comics career, and beyond. But we will be talking about Way of X and then, of course, into the upcoming Onslaught Revelation. Uh, spoilers for the five issues that have been released this year in 2021 may follow. Okay, we're going to talk about some plot details and some questions about some of the characters involved. If you have not read Way of X, I highly recommend that you do. It's only five issues, a part of the X-Men's Reign of X, as Nightcrawler seeks answers regarding his place on the mutant nation of Krakoa and tries to establish a new religious center for mutant culture as some vile and manipulative elements slither into the way mutants are behaving. We're going to talk about all that here with Sai. Uh, Sai, thanks so much for joining today. Before we get started asking you questions, I do just want to say for those of you who are able to join us live, first off, thanks for hopping in here on uh, what is a Monday morning, my time. Appreciate that. And uh, definitely get in any questions that you have here in the live chat. We'll try to answer any of the good ones. Uh, the super chat should be available. So if you get that in, I will definitely prioritize it. Um, otherwise, just ask that you be respectful and polite to those around you. And we'll have a good, nice, clean interview here. Clean-ish, <laughs> as we discussed with uh, Sai. So Sai, first off, congratulations on the newest member of the family. Um, I know you have a little one. So congratulations. Thank you very much. I've just, uh, here I, oh, there is go to call. Sorry, I'm having technical craziness. Thank you. Yes, well, likewise, you you, uh, you mentioned you've got a month old. I've got a two month old. So um, my uh, my opening gambit was going to be go easy on me because I'm exhausted and, and have no fuel left in the tank. But uh, I mean, you look wide awake compared to me. So I really have no complaints and no right to whinge. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it, morning's not too bad because I, I get a ton of coffee going early, but then definitely post like post lunch, you know, post lunch. And then yeah, that's, that's where I that's where I have the toddler. Um, who's still taking naps where that's pretty convenient where I can be like, Oh, I guess I, I guess I better lay down with them. <laughs> better, better help them get down for a nap. Yeah. You've got, you've got three, right? So got I mean, three. That's, yep. we've got two. Uh, number one is he's just turned three. So he's kind of, we expected him to be sad and jealous and, and just a little bit mopey about the fact that his little sister has arrived. And it's not like that at all. He's actually wonderful with her. He's just awesome. He's about 80% more naughty than he was. And uh, and yeah, mum and dad both have lots of work to do. And there's no time for anything. Yeah, like, yeah. That's funny. No, that is that is the nature of... Uh, uh, people say the terrible twos, uh, you know, has a reputation. But actually, I found it's uh, it's, it's really closer to three when they, I mean, when they start. Terrible, if, we're, if, we, if we were able to switch off our emotions and remove our hearts from the thing, it's awful. It's a terrible, terrible idea. <laughs> Nobody should do it. <laughs> for sure um all right so how, how much you know on that vein how much does fatherhood and writing about comics intersect for you like how many times a day do you think to yourself this is something that i, I just thought of reading some of your work like i bet professor x has never changed a diaper like i bet he's never no, had the experience no, of, of changing no. a diaper is that just no, like no, always in your mind now? it's a good question it is but not necessarily at the forefront it's like i i, I had a look yesterday at my kind of active slate all these different projects i've got going in comics and outside of comics in one form or another every single one of these too many projects are related to parenthood mm -hmm. or yeah and, and like often in quite abstract or, or uh a kind of slightly sneaky ways that you wouldn't necessarily see outright but it's all there love inheritance uh, transmission of ideas, nature versus nurture, all of these things, they're kind of bubbling away constantly. The only thing that I don't think I've ever stopped to wonder is, uh, until this week, how proud or ashamed will I be when my oldest kid is old enough to start thumbing through comics <laughs> that mm. we've got on the shelf? Like, there's already a little stash that we keep up here, like stuff I used to do for Avatar, which is definitely, definitely not getting read by him mm -hmm. <laughs> until he's well past 18. So, yeah, it's uh, it, it preys on the mind. Uh, with regard to Xavier and Legion, I mean, it's it, it's simply that that is um, the liquidity the of their relationship is obviously always going to be about... Um, Xavier as 
the way I tend to see it, he's clearly the right man for the job up to now, you know, uh, like there's that old adage about um, freedom fighters, woe betide the freedom fighter who actually succeeds because they are fighting for a world in which they have no place. If you're a really good soldier, a really good warrior, you successfully secure the peace, you've got nothing left to do. You are superfluous. Your own superfluousness is built in. Xavier has always been this relentlessly unflinching, unbending man of duty who does exactly what needs to be done for his people. And according to most of the mores of our culture, that makes him a hero. Right. Um, but he's a terrible dad and probably not a very nice man to be around. You probably wouldn't want to meet him in a pub and have a drink with him. He's probably a little bit frightening <laughs> and fanatical to mm -hmm. chat to. Um, so yeah, there's there's that that question. You know, you sort of want you want to be able to have your heroes both ways, and I don't know that it's possible. Like I've read lots of accounts by the children of like apartheid campaigners and anti-apartheid campaigners, obviously, and um, similar kind of uh, uh, activists, and they don't often make very good parents. You know, they make extraordinary storied people who history remembers fondly because they changed the world for the better. But as human beings, they're usually quite sucky. Um, so that's a bunch of stuff that we sort of want to explore further with regard to Xavier and, and David Haller. For me, the interesting part of this whole paradigm is that David Haller starts to recognize within himself the same tendencies as his dad you know they've, they've they've never really had a particularly great relationship but especially in this this most recent arc of way of x legion has noticed himself treating people quite badly like he's always quite goal oriented and and listen there's a whole bunch of uh mental health metaphors that that we we should not and i will not look at too closely because they're most useful when they're not specific they're most useful when it's about people struggling with their own um their own inner demons their own uh mental state but clearly there are traits about legion which you could assign to all sorts of different um behavioral spectrums he struggles to empathize i think and that's something that i tend to associate with Xavier. Um, so hopefully we're on a journey where Legion is fixing himself. He wants to be better than his dad. He wants to be a leader for now rather than a leader for the days when mutants have to fight for self-determination. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's all really well said. It, it is interesting, I think, this the way you're able to explore Professor X through Legion in particular, um, you know, because obviously because of the dynamics they have there, and Legion just has this fascinating place in the Krakoa era where he's so connected to all these major players who we actually have not seen a heck of a lot of, you know, the Professor X, yeah. the Moira, right? All, all these individuals um, where he just has this really unique relationship. Uh, speaking of Legion, let's start there since, it, since that's where the first answer went into. Um, this is a character that obviously you have tremendous familiarity with through uh, the X-Men Legacy, which is a great run. I think, you know, anytime people are talking about the character of Legion, obviously you have your, your Claremont and Sienkiewicz, you know, Origins and New Mutants. But then I think your run on X-Men Legacy, like that's the go-to for Legion. And so you have this character come in, in Way of X number one. Um, he begins working with Kurt, right? He begins working with Nightcrawler, trying to figure out, like, they're the voices willing to question Krakoa and actually see the cracks and the malevolence in the people. Sure. Um one particular aspect I found really interesting here is like how Legion's mantra, I rule me, which is something you build to in, in X-Men Legacy, right? This idea of him being in control, him him actually like controlling sort of what is going on. He's always been isolated and he's often been manipulated, right? How that stacks against a shared cultural belonging, which is what we're trying to establish or what mutants are trying to establish on Krakoa, right? So sort of I rule me versus shared cultural belonging, shared nationality. Yep. Whether we realize it or not, nations have a way of shaping our thinking, right? It's it's a part of who we are, but it also dictates a lot of what we do. Do you think there's ever a piece, like a home for Legion on a place like Krakoa? Like, do you think that's something that could be achieved with that character? Yes. Uh, 
I have to I have to tread a little carefully because we're we're sort of skirting the rim of spoil of spoiler territory slightly. Um, sure. The the mantra that you mentioned, I rule me, that sort of ends up playing quite a large role in in the way that we develop things in the onslaught revelation. So just to, to kind of back up a little bit, um, if Way of X is season one of a story and if way of x is about the hunt for a big idea then onslaught revelation is kind of the season finale and it's the crisis that occurs when the idea has been discovered i'm talking in really vague terms here because it, it does give away a great deal if i if i get any more detail than that yep and season two which i really can't talk about but that's sort of coming down the pipe that's kind of the idea and application and and we see how things develop. So um, all the way through Way of X, we've been we've been mostly following these two very different characters, Nightcrawler and Legion. Um, we'll we'll certainly come back to Nightcrawler, but but the way that I've kind of just as a cheat sheet doesn't quite hold water when you examine it closely. But the cheat sheet is that Nightcrawler is a creature of heart, Legion is a creature of mind. And so together they're able to examine things, uh, ask questions about things, look at things from a different perspective than anybody else would be able to. And so to your point that they're, they're kind of, it's not like we're looking for cracks. It's not like we set out to go, okay, everybody loves the era of Krakoa, except me. Uh, I think <laughs> and I'm gonna find all the shit that's wrong with it. I'm yeah. gonna point it out and we're gonna go around digging crampons into all the cracks and levering them open. That's that's not quite what we're doing. What we're doing is saying all these amazing books, starting with Hickman's work and all the way through everybody else, my amazing, talented colleagues in the X room, mostly, not entirely, but mostly their books are about what happens when you have this incredible society of superpowered beings who are self-determined for the first time, who are um, expressing their own right to pursue happiness for the first time. And generally, the stories that they tell are outward focused. They're, here is an obstacle that we encounter as we achieve self-determination. Here is a baddie who comes from outside to screw us over. That sort of stuff. Uh, and if it's not those things, then it's inward looking in quite uh, specific ways. You know, here's a uh, murder mystery. Here's um, a villain who's been screwing with things on the inside of the society, that sort of stuff. What interested me was how does this society function? How, what would it be like to live in this society, first of all? A society which is not entirely, but most interestingly defined by its... <laughs> its attitude towards death. This is a this is a culture where anybody who dies can be brought back to life quite mm -hmm. swiftly. That's that's the, the kind of the miracle of Krikoa. What does that do to people? Um, it makes them question who they are. It makes them question the meaningfulness or meaninglessness of life and death. All these sort of snowballs of um, introspection, which like you can imagine a lot of Krakoans lying awake at night. <laughs> staring at the ceiling and thinking, oh my God, what the hell? What's going on? <laughs> Nightcrawler is a really good character to deal with that because he does think and he questions and he doesn't pretend to have all the answers and he often thinks with his heart rather than his head. To temper that, you have to have David. David is a creature of mind. He's going to be logical. He's going to be manipulative. He's going to fall into the same trap as his father, Xavier, which is to see mutants as less important than mutant kind hmm. he sees initially like xavier without meaning to he doesn't want to be like this but he sees individuals as little pieces to move around a board like a general in one of those war rooms sliding little wooden counters across the table and sure he probably stops and is very sad when trauma occurs and people get hurt and things get broken but that's not the big picture they're big picture people um and so the journey that David has been on throughout Way of X has been to kind of acknowledge that he needs to be better. He needs to embrace uh, human individualist thinking. And, and all the way through, we're interrogating the difference between being a person and being a people. 
that's what Hickman has given us. The metaphors have changed from being um, mutants as a stand-in for any number of um, uh, persecuted cultures, subcultures, countercultures, whatever. You know, we've, we've seen them all used beautifully in the past. The new metaphor allows you to start examining a people, uh, society, civilizations. It's scaled everything up while still letting us tell stories about individuals, which is really, really clever. Mm -hmm. and, and exactly why this, this Krakoa era is so creatively fertile. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's been about uh, crashing, in, in David's case, particularly, it's been about making him acknowledge and, and by the way this is sort of how x-men legacy ended spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't read that david's whole thing was if you can't cure something because it's part of who you are you have to accept it you have to own it and you have to do anything you can to make sure that you're the only person who gets to say anything about it so it's this, this sort of codified mantra we've talked about, I rule me. At the end of X-Men Legacy, he is aware that his own flaws are going to cause a catastrophe. And so the only way that he can express I rule me is to literally erase himself from reality. And that's a victory for him. That's him saying, nobody gets to say how my story ends except me. And that all sort of has has weird legacies in its own right because really nobody should have brought him back but they did because Marvel so here we are with <laughs> um, but anyway the, the, the kind of repeat beat that I'm toying with here is if you're the son of a leader who's a manipulator and frankly a, a cold fish and you think that you need to be better and you think that the paradigm has changed what do you do and I think the answer is that he he does something that nobody else can do. He takes himself off the table to an extent. And in return for taking himself off the table, he gives mutants and mutant kind, individuals and societally, a, a new tool. And that's what we explore in the Onslaught Revelation. And I can't talk about it, but it's really trippy and it's really cool. And it's something that I don't think has ever been done before in X-Men comics. Amazing, cool. I'm I'm excited to see what that is. I definitely, I thought I I thought I had a feel for it, but then I, I've been reading interviews you talking about like how excited you are about the idea and how different it is, and I'm like, I, okay, I probably don't know what this is yet, <laughs> which is exciting. That's good. That's yeah. good. I, I'm I'm looking forward to it. So, all right, there's there's a lot to touch on there, and I think we'll come back to a lot of it. Um, before we do though, I do want to sort of backtrack a little bit and just talk about so the five issue wave X started releasing in May. Um, but I'm curious, like, when did you start collaborating with the X office? And can you talk a little bit about how it has compared to other experiences you've had in in comics? Because, like, prior to this, too, you know, you were in the, the Sandman universe, right? You were, you know, a, a driver of that launch with the dreaming. Um, how do those how do those experiences compare and kind of like for, for readers who are like, is this actually different from how comics typically function? You know, kind of what's your read on that situation? I mean, it, it, it totally is. Um, it's really strange. So uh, to answer the first part, uh, I pitched Jordan a bunch of ideas. I, I got chatting to Jerry at Thought Bubble a few years ago, um, and it was clear that they, they being the, the X room that was still, I think, in its kind of nebulous stage, they had mentioned my name. My name had come up because of the X-Men Legacy connection, and I was like, well, hey, I'd love to, I'd love to play in that sound pit again so so you know don't be shy about shouting my name if any if any opportunities arise and i heard from jordan and i pitched some ideas and um the idea that ended up being way of x i think i called it way of x from the beginning hmm. um was the one that they kind of uh glommed onto it gets fudgy in my mind partly because babies and partly just because the the timelines of these things are always quite convoluted but at, at some point the plague came along the apocalypse ruined everything for everybody um i had this <laughs> i had this really bad week where like four jobs that i was either doing or about to start doing 
all got cancelled all in the same week. I went from having far more work than I would comfortably be able to do to almost having nothing on my slate with a baby on the way. So um, that was scary. And one of the ones that, that went the way of the dodo was this um, planned X book. So I just kind of uh, chalked it up to to experience and assumed it wasn't going to happen. Hmm. Occasionally gave Jordan a nudge just in case anything moved and then forgot about that, gave up on that. In the interim, uh, X-Men 7, I want to say, came out, which is the one where uh, Nightcrawler kind of asks all these big questions and um, the Crucible is kind of explored for the first time. Um, and shortly after that, Jordan just came back in touch out of the blue and said, OK, we're going to do this. Let's go. Um, and yeah, it was just off to the races because a lot of the a lot of the questions that I had been asking in the pitch were were sort of being touched upon in X-Men 7 in yeah. such a way that I could then go running with them without having to stop and, and really kind of examine them from, from um, first base. So that was nice. Um, I couldn't tell you how much things changed. I, I, I'm pretty sure it was Nightcrawler from the beginning. Um, and it was always, I mean, that's that's the real trick. When When we were sort of marketing the book it's very easy to say it's a book about nightcrawler coming up with a mutant religion because that's an easy elevator pitch it, it's completely wrong it's not really that at all it's it's sort of about him thinking that maybe that's what he needs to come up with and quite quickly realizing that that's not going to cut it and we were we were really keen from the beginning that whatever the solution he comes up with it has to be something which is additive rather than exclusive like it, it can't replace his existing faith it shouldn't be that we're telling this story about a bunch of mutants telling readers that they're wrong to be christians or jews or muslims or buddhists or hindus or anything or atheists for that matter it, it should be something that's clever that unites that's creative something it's essentially an idea that's the whole thing is about we need an idea to unite all mutants so that they feel meaningful. So every mutant from, you know, the A-listers who are running around in spandex fighting baddies to some nobody who doesn't have a name who appears in the background of a shot, <laughs> you know, in one panel ever, they need to have the same level of value and investment in this system, in this new world. Otherwise, it's just the same as the old world where there's you know a hierarchy of importance and and some people are designated as heroes and and gods among us and others are just sort of bored if you're stuck in paradise with nothing to do and no villains to go and punch you're going to be bored stiff so this examined all of those and there's a whole bunch of kind of sociological science behind it that, that we sort of touch on a little bit like that's why we included dr nemesis he's just somebody who can occasionally pop up and say did you know you can only maintain 150 meaningful relationships with anyone <laughs> um, so yeah we were just sort of interested in that and the whole trick has been how do you tell a story which asks these questions which which wonders how it's possible to create a new functioning civilization which isn't just a bunch of people sitting around talking. There should be action, adventure, exciting moments, comedy, tragedy, uh, trauma. And that's, that's what we've tried to do with Way of X. And, and like the, the onslaught of it all is really a, a kind of um, a, a way of, this is a very superhero thing to do. It's, it's a way of saying, here is our theme, here's our big, our big idea. The problem that we face is uh, a society with no limits has no values and will just spin out of control. Um, let's make that personified. Let's make that onslaught. Let's say onslaught is the darkness inside the hearts and souls of mutant kind, which is no less than the unvarnished truth of what that character always was. And let's use it to catalyze and uh, exacerbate these things that we're interested in talking about anyway. And so, yeah, that's that's kind of how we ended up with this uh, seemingly simple dynamic of big bad 
and two heroes trying to do something about him. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's talk about that a little bit. So the big issue to reveal, which definitely got me very excited, is you have this patchwork man, which is you know Kirk Cohen boogeyman, right? And it's it's the implication early was like, oh, maybe it's an altar of legion. No, instead it's another era of Professor X. It's onslaught, right? The combined rage and might of, of Professor X and Magneto from the '90s onslaught saga. In Way of X number five, the most recent issue, it's revealed that Onslaught's presence is sustained by the gaps in resurrection, right? Like the space between backups and when a person dies, which has been a really interesting question, right? There's this lost personhood, lost memory. Um, and Onslaught is like in sneaking into, my understanding here is like sneaking into basically any mutant that's been resurrected and sort of amplifying their hate and their rage. Um, and and shouts, shouts here to Storm for denying resurrection and giant size Storm. Uh, which feels especially pertinent now. I feel like she's the only character that I can say without a doubt has not been resurrected, which is which is really interesting. <laughs> um, but I think apart from the obvious, like, what do we do about Onslaught? You know, kind of the big superhero battle stuff you're talking about where you have Legion, Nightcrawler, maybe being the only ones who are aware of this presence and actually able to do something about it. I see some really concerning implications here, especially for the crowd of readers who've been hammering the X-Men or villains now drums since House of X and Powers of Ten, right? There's there's a segment of fandom that has definitely taken issue with the behavior of mutant kind, essentially. So so here's the question. Are the actions of the Krakoa era all compromised by Onslaught, or do you intend this as a more localized short-term influence, or is it not that simple? And, and we're going to learn about it in Onslaught Revelation. Um, I kind of have to take the fifth with that one. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> It's, I think it's not that simple. Um, to an extent, the, the answer I will give is the same answer that I would give for any question of continuity, which is that if, if it doesn't contradict your headcanon, if it helps you to pass something which you struggled to feel, to pass, then sure, make that be the thing. Um, what I will say is that Onslaught Revelation is a, a done-in-one, oversized one-shot. It lays a lot of track for stuff that we come back to, but um, I don't think, for instance, you're going to see a line-wide change in the way that characters behave yeah. after it. Some characters, because you know, I'm more interested in some characters than others, um, there are some good answers for the questions that you're you're referring to and the, and the fans you refer to the questions that they've been asking and the sort of the concerns that they might have there are definitely things out there in the ether amongst the the writers which have like seeds that have been laid long ago which which will eventually reach fruition um I don't know that it will please everybody. You can't please everybody all the time. You should always you should always try, obviously. But I, I think um, I can't speak for for Jonathan, but I know that his overriding interest was in creating a new era, which functions as a, a lens upon civilization as well as a lens upon individuality. Um, if there are fans who feel like characters have changed beyond all recognition, then in some cases that may be for good reason. In some cases, it may just be because that's Jonathan's view of those characters. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we all read comics. We've all been reading comics long enough to know that characters do oscillate. Their voices change. Um, are the X-Men baddies now? No, I don't think so. Are they heroes? No, I don't think so. <laughs> They're, they're people trying to create a self-determined society. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that without asking difficult questions of yourself. Um, this, is, this is kind of the bread and butter of the stuff I'm interested in. There is no such thing as a society which got everything right from the beginning it started. There is probably no such thing as a society which hasn't caused really disgusting human rights violations at some stage or another along the way. Um, we know that certain mutants are making all those mistakes. We know that certain mutants are very afraid of making those mistakes and are trying to do everything they can not to. That's, that's to, to, to keep hammering the same point. The beauty of this is that it's not just about 
mutant kind. It's about all the individual mutants within that. Mm -hmm. So um, they are collectively trying to make a functional society and a functioning civilization, which is a really big, hard science fiction question that everybody from Asimov right on down has struggled with in the past. More importantly, we're telling this vast epic story through the medium of character beats. And so there are going to be some bastards. There are going to be some characters who are not doing the things you want them to do because their um, dedication to the cause of mutant self-determination is more important to them than their dedication to being a good person. Um, and that exactly, to, to go back to stuff I've already waffled about, that is where you find Nightcrawler and Legion scratching their heads and trying to figure out whether they are in that camp or the other camp, uh, whether there is such a thing as a hero or a villain when it comes to a whole people trying to trying to achieve its own destiny. Um, they're the big questions. And I think we'd be wrong to pretend that there's a single answer for these questions. And so we're showing lots and lots of different versions of these answers. Yeah, no, I, that makes sense. And I, I think that's increasingly important too. You know, I think one thing uh, definitely that I've been hearing a lot and trying to internalize is, you know, cultures that you might be less familiar with are not a monolith of opinion, right, is is a phrase that, that continues to recur. And I think as you extend the mutant metaphor, right, out to civilizations and cultures, the same thinking should apply, right? Different individuals yeah. within the structure are going to react differently and are, are going to behave differently. It doesn't, uh, characterizing all of mutant kind as good or bad, right? That's a that's a, a binary that probably does not exist. And that's probably an important yep. thing to show. Um, obviously the way Nightcrawler approaches things is going to be vastly different than say Magneto or, or even Legion, um, which is very much the point here. So, okay, I, th I think that's a good answer. I think definitely, you know, I'm excited again to see an Onslaught Revelation, how that manifests and, and how that's gonna carry forward. I, I thought it was really interesting in your, um, one of the X-Men Mondays you did, I think the most recent one, AIPT interview with Chris Hassan, who does a great job over there, um, you like an onslaught to the flu, you know, sort of this more more evil virus than specific supervillain entity. Um, I was curious, kind of how you how you sort of came to that interpretation of this character that I think is it is sort of like '90s supervillain personified in some ways, but also very nebulous. Uh, I'm just kind of curious about your process in terms of like settling on onslaught, and then also just your own understanding of of what you wanted that that being to represent because he's not he is not even a he right like it's this it's this nebulous concept almost um so yeah i'll let you answer uh the character i mean it's not a character is it i mean that's that's kind of what we're circling around it's it's an amazing visual that has been a big, terrifying, clanking bogeyman in the past. And it comes with so many nostalgia threads attached that as soon as you mention the name, um, a lot of old readers, by which I mean readers of the old stuff, I'm not saying that readers are old. Um, no, will, that, that's fair. <laughs> <You're not laughs> yeah, great, great head readers will, will get excited because it means something to them. It means uh, a particular era, a particular feeling, a particular vibe, maybe even particular stories, although, you know, um, there probably aren't many who would swear that the the onslaught arcs of the past were kind of <laughs> amazing literature. They were really good, exciting comic book stories, but, um, but let's not pretend that this is an incredibly finely wrought character with multitudes of complexities and inner conflicts yeah. so in order to have my cake and eat it which is to say in order to enjoy the recognition of the character and all the profound excitement that comes with it and the level of threat that comes with it but also to not feel like i was stuck with some weird um and not very relevant specificity some sort of granular version of this character that never really existed as far as i can see it made sense to pare it down to 
what I suspect it really is, and I mentioned it before, it's the darkness inside mutant kind. It, it comes originally from Xavier and Magneto. It's it's kind of the the craving for domination that comes from their hearts and souls, and and you know, in some in some strange way, uh, became entangled around each other's psychic selves you know it's it's we sort of have a little bit of fun with it calling them its fathers and and you know it's sort of implied that this is their baby in some way which is um which is i guess no no less than the truth but it it's essentially the black mirror it's it's what happens when mutants as a people rather than as people look into a cracked mirror and what looks back at them it's hmm. it's the moment that mutants go from a persecuted people who deserve to stand on their own two feet and be left the fuck alone to the most powerful individuals on the planet who can dominate anybody else that they choose to dominate. And yeah. you know, that's, that's when we can definitively say the X-Men and all mutants have become baddies. And, and I don't think that's on the card <laughs> anytime soon because they have spent too long being the persecuted minority that a taste of power is not suddenly going to make them into tyrants. Um, but the capacity to be that is obviously there. Hmm. In the same way that when you get kicked by a bully and then you go and get pumped, the first thing you want to do is to go and break the bully's head because that feels just, it's not just, it's just perpetuating a cycle of um, tit for tat, which which I don't think we want to get into. But anyway, the, the question is what's Onslaught? In my view, Onslaught is a psychic parasitical entity which feasts upon mutant darkness, the tendency for destruction, domination, and most importantly, self-destruction which exists within, frankly, all people, but for the purposes of our story, within all mutants. Hmm. And it has, it has, by strange means, and, and by the way, with some, some canny manipulation by outside forces, which we'll get into in Onslaught Revelation, it has been utilized, weaponized, injected as a Trojan horse into Krakoan society, specifically to expedite this collapse civilization decay cascade which society sociologists so i can't talk sociologists will tell you is what happens this condition called anomie which is what happens when uh, a limitless society society without limits is left to its own devices pretty soon everything decays so onslaught is kind of the face of that he's the face and the the, the kind of the the poking finger that is catalyzing all of this to happen um and in true superhero form, as I said right up front of this interview, you know, it's it's really just an excuse to look at some really interesting social and cultural questions, but to put a big purple face on them <laughs> and to say we have to have a fight at some point. And uh, the fight that will ensue is pretty much the whole of the second half of Onslaught Revelation, and it does not take place in the location you would expect expect and it does not take place in the way that you would expect um it's incredibly trippy and bob quinn has has drawn his heart out it's some of the most amazing art i've ever seen so yeah i think i think everybody's going to be um surprised and and hopefully delighted awesome awesome yeah we should definitely give credit here to bob quinn javier tartaglia got clayton cowles on letters throughout wave x i've, I've been loving Quinn and Tartaglia's uh, interpretation of Nightcrawler, in addition to other characters, but I, I think the art on this book has been excellent. Um, I'm, I'm yeah. really looking forward to some psychedelic onslaught battling. Uh, that sounds really cool. I really like that interpretation of the of the Black Mirror, sort of of, of all of all mutant kind essentially having their own onslaught potential, right? As as the Dark Mirror of Professor X, you know, kind of being that '90s manifestation of that character. Um, so just to clarify something you said there, so like, is it so we know? that Orcus like injected Onslaught into Krakoa or is that uh, left for interpretation at this point? Uh, that gets clarified in, in Onslaught Revelation. I'm not going to, I'm not going to put too fine a point on that here, but yeah, that gets, that gets clarified quite carefully. Gotcha. Gotcha. And another semantics thing 
another just like the specifics of my nerdy what actually happened here when legion gets resurrected um in issue two nightcrawler there's a big moment where he you know essentially has to has to euthanize legion who's been captured by orcus can you sort of describe your thinking behind the way legion's resurrection manifested um the sequence i found very interesting and compelling but it left me a bit confused and i'm wondering if you could shine some light on how your interpretation of what happened there like what that what readers should take away from that? Sure. Um, okay. Well, what I want readers to take away from that is uh, when your dad's an asshole who refuses to resurrect you and you're an all powerful mutant, you can just do it yourself. And, and that's, that's clearly the, the kind of the, the character side of stuff, which matters. It's, it's this beautiful moment that, we are so familiar at this point with seeing the way that the resurrection process happens. There's the five who are there creating new bodies, downloading everything, the brains, everything is formed perfectly. And then along comes Xavier or somebody else with a cerebral helmet and essentially downloads the, the anima, the, the, the person, the whatever it is. And, and I'll come back to exactly what that is in a moment because that's a big question. Um, we've seen that a lot. What I wanted was a moment that they got right to the end, that last beat, and then Xavier says, nope, not doing it. He's my son. I love him. He's cool, but he's also broken. And if I bring him back, he's going to threaten everything that I have spent decades building because he can't be trusted and he's just a bit too broken for his own good. And it's not his fault, by the way. He's lovely, but we can't trust him. So let's not bring him back. Yeah. And then David just does it anyway, because he can. And I just wanted that moment of seeing Xavier's face fall and the moment that I loved that panel where Legion looks at him and, and <laughs> he's rude about his helmet. You look what does he say? He looks like you look like a crap Death Star or something like that. Crap astronaut, yeah, yeah. That's it, yeah. Um there was a really rude version that they wouldn't let me get away with originally. But uh <laughs> but yeah. So that was I mean it, what readers should take away from it is that, that Legion can do stuff for himself that nobody else says that he can or can't do because I rule me. The bigger question, which is what we're sort of alluding to here, is exactly what is going on during the resurrection process. And to sit and consider that question is to go chasing off in the direction that we've already touched upon. Are the X-Men all clones? Are they all baddies? Have they got souls? In my view, it would A, be foolish to answer any of these questions because they all give us lots of really good story juice. And as I said at the beginning, if you're a Krakoan who's just been resurrected, you will lie awake at night wondering whether you were brought into being as an artificial creature with your memories downloaded up to the point that they were recorded. Your continuity of consciousness did not persist between the moment you died and the moment you're resurrected. You are literally a new being with the illusion of memories of being an old being. Mm -hmm. Or is it that there is some sort of intangible soul which, because science and magic uh cerebro is recording and storing and then at the moment of resurrection transferring into the new body now to all intents and purposes practically speaking the latter is what we are telling our readers and the mutants in that world is going on mm -hmm. people who come back after resurrection are the same people who died but clearly there are cracks in that firmament. There are the questions like the one that we're dealing with in, in the whole onslaught thing where, as Nightcrawler puts it in the onslaught revelation, if you get recorded on a Tuesday and you die on a Thursday, what happened to Wednesday? And the answer is onslaught ate it. And that's what's making him strong and making mm -hmm. him all powerful. Um, but I do think like you get into a kind of Rick and Morty style thing where, you know, nothing matters, nothing is meaningful. Everybody is just a meat computer that's had its memory dumped in from some simulated core. Ultimately, I don't think it matters in terms of reading the story. 
you start from a position of these characters will probably be a bit weirded out by this. Mm -hmm. You maybe progress to the point that, as I have, the young characters will probably get over this a lot quicker than the older characters and will maybe start to embrace it as something that you can enjoy, something that you can have some fun with. This is a, a utility that even becomes a thrill. A lot of older characters, especially the ones who come from a position of faith, like Nightcrawler, will probably spend a lot more time scratching their heads about it. Yep. But I don't think, certainly I won't, and I don't imagine many of the other writers are intending to say, here is exactly what happens. There is objectively a soul transfer occurring. Um, I think it would be a terrible mistake to go down that line. You don't like, as, as especially a community of writers, but as a single writer, you avoid anything which feels like painting yourself into a corner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that makes sense. I, I think the way you've clarified that makes a lot of sense to me. And it's also, I think as readers, you can have that question and can desire that answer, but ultimately having the mystery spoiled <laughs> will make a less enjoyable reading experience. Um, totally. It's not the same thing, but you know, like the mystery of Wolverine's origins for me is always way more exciting than any any possible story, regardless of how well it's told in some ways, um, is, yeah, yeah. is that absence of knowing and sort of leaving it to your own determination. So I, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely with you on that just as a fan, as, as a reader. Um, all right. So we got season two of way of X we know is coming post onslaught revelation. You've said in interviews and in here that it's the idea in action. So I'm, I'm very curious to see exactly how that manifests. Should fans expect a limited series or a longer run? Um, kind of how, or maybe put another way, how far into the future do your plans for the Way of X crew in season two sort of extend? Well, it will, but the first thing to say is it won't be called Way of X. It has a new title, uh, which I obviously cannot spoil. Um, yeah. The, the, the grim but practical answer is that everything is a mini series until it isn't. And everything is an ongoing until it's a miniseries. Mm. Um, that is the nature of the beast. It's it's not what anybody wants. Um, there are so many strange schedule things that are, are having an influence upon the way that publishing happens. And and you know that's to that's that's to even avoid the the question of numbers. As far as I know, Way of X did amazingly well in numbers terms, but. For one reason or another, it was decided, and I think it was the right decision, that it made sense to stop it there and then progress to our next step in a way that I think everybody is going to really enjoy. And it's, you know, it's that there are reasons for that being the right decision, and I generally agree with those. Okay. Um, the hope is always that when you launch something new with a one, you're going to get, you'll certainly get five. And then either your numbers aren't good enough or something else happens or you keep on trucking. So for this season two, I've absolutely got the first arc nailed down very tight. The second and third arcs are ready to go if I get them. But it pays to write in modular terms. You're always writing with an ending in mind. That's something that it always annoyed me about kind of the old school of ongoing comics is that you're you're kind of rewarded for not giving people endings. And, and honestly, yeah. I believe the story, I mean, you know this, you're a fan of Sitcom Gorilla. Stories don't matter if they don't have endings. And so you have to always have a, a sense of closure in mind. So stories should always, if they progress, it's because an ending is also a beginning, not because you're just keeping those wheels spinning in some endlessly perpetual way. Uh, this all gets a bit meta, actually, when you start talking about resurrection, you know, if, if sure, you yeah. meaning, then, then does life have meaning either? Um, everything is stories, baby. But yeah, that's that's sort of the, the grim answer. Um, I will definitely have five issues. I hope to have 10. I hope to have 15. I hope to have 20. Who knows? But um, nothing is ongoing until you go past five and everything is a mini series <laughs> until somebody says, do you want to do some more? Yeah, yeah. No, that makes. I mean, that's that's definitely seems to be the consistent answer from creators. Just the way the business works. Um, do, do you feel that pressure when you're writing, or do you do you avoid that as much as possible and just be like, I have a story, I'm going to tell it my way? Or are there certain, like for example, like inclusion of onslaught, right? In inclusion of something big and comic booky. Like are are moves like that a part of you being like, I need to, I need to elevate the sales part of this. How much does that influence your your actual storytelling? 
more than I would like. I mean, there's, you know, I can't deny that. Um, one is always looking for the big character, the big artist, the big beat, the big, let's make sure that if I do something in my book, uh, I really want it to pay over into everybody else's book because that creates the impression of some uh, grand crossover, whether or not that's cynical or, or meaningful. That's, I mean, I, I, by the way, realize I never answered a question you asked earlier because I was so busy waffling about something else. But um, the beauty of the X office is that we do constantly confer. And in it, it is closer to uh, like a TV writer's room than anything else I've ever been part of. Um, mm. I have done a couple of TV writer's rooms and it's, it's the same vibe. Uh, there's no ownership of ideas. Everybody's just jamming on ideas. If somebody says something that works in somebody else's book, then it goes in somebody else's book, not that mm. person's. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a really kind of utopian way of creating. Um, it means that we are generally additive when it comes to this cynical, let's make everybody's book sell kind of attitude. Um, yeah. I think a rising tide lifts all boats in this sense. Um, there's the stuff that I can't talk about it clearly, you know, what I'm, what I'm alluding to is stuff that's going to be line wide rather than book wide. So, um, you enjoy your little corner and the creative freedom that affords you, but even more so you subordinate yourself to the grand project and have a lot of fun with the ideas that you have and that other people have and, and kind of mixing them all together. Again, it's very meta because we're talking about the distinction between people and a people, and here we are being writers and a just out writer. So um, it's quite nice. Good, good. No, I, I think that ties into one question I think a lot of fans are asking and, and one I was thinking about too is like, I think you just answered it in part, but what would you say to sort of assuage the fears of X fans running around like, you know, chickens with their heads cut off following the announcement that Jonathan Hickman won't be a part of the, the X office post Inferno? Like what would be your reaction to a fan who's like, I can't believe Hickman's not going to be here after Inferno um, to, to convince them that it's it, one, it's going to be okay. And two, we have a lot of good X-Men comics coming. Uh, I mean, by saying so, it's going to be okay. And we have a lot of great X-Men comics coming. Um, <laughs> listen, what, what Jonathan did was um, have an amazing idea, which made the sand pit the biggest and best sand pit there is and he invited a bunch of other writers to come and play in that sand pit he also had an idea for what happens when that sand pit changes and another idea for when that sand pit has to go away or change into something else yeah in the event and, and by the way we we have those thoughts you know we know what those will be if and when we come to those um, and that's a big if, because it turned out in the event that everybody loved the sandpit so much, they sort of started to wonder, does this have to be a, a temporary thing? You know, even if, even if at some point, let's all be really brutally real here for a moment, probably, not definitely, but probably at some point, somebody with more money than actual creative sense will say, Reset, everything reset. Who knows? Maybe that's 20 years down the line. Let's hope so, because right now, this paradigm is the most creative and the most fertile it has been for, certainly for, for decades, certainly since I started reading comics. Um, John is going away, having left us with this incredible genetic database of stories. And we know that uh he had plans that we can still use it, it's not like he's not going to be part of the slack anymore he's going to keep keep an eye on us hmm. because these are his babies uh he knows that, that is plans. that's really comforting i think for a lot of fans i think a lot of fans are treating this like he's deleting his slack account <laughs> like yeah. won't talk to you guys. I, think, <laughs> I think there was some i think there was perhaps some some slightly unhelpful reportage which implied that he was kind of flipping the table and walking away as if he'd been scared out of the room yeah not a bit of it um he he has left things set up in such a way that nobody is going to be disappointed including him 
Um, the spirit of the threads that he has left us will continue to be pursued and respected. Um, we know exactly where he originally thought things were going to go, and we can still go there if we want to. But to, to paraphrase him, if Act 1 is going well enough that you don't want to go to Act 2, then just keep enjoying <laughs> Act 1. Mm -hmm. And if, if Act 1 turns into a different Act 2 organically and beautifully, then let it. Don't feel like you have to go down these bloody train tracks because things have changed. Mm. So I don't know if that's comforting. I, I, can't, I can't persuade somebody who assumes that something is only good if its architect is present that actually that's not always the case. Listen, let's just go even more meta. I was waffling earlier on about the fact that, you know, no warriors should secure peace because they're doomed. Charles Xavier is really good at being the person who fights for freedom, but probably not the best person to maintain the freedom. It's okay to acknowledge that sometimes if the architect has other things going on, there are other people to come and build the facade and other people to build the inside of a place. Yeah. Um, all these building metaphors you will understand when you read Onslaught Revelation are very apposite. Uh, but for now, I, I just, I guarantee you that the plans we have are beautiful and surprising and they have the Hickman thumbs up if that's all that matters. <laughs> but it yeah. shouldn't be. You should, you should care more about whether the stories are cool rather than whether Hickman is the one who's writing them, in my view. Yeah, all right. That was an excellent answer, and I think uh, going to comfort some uh, some scared readers. <laughs> I think not all, but some. All right, perfect. I, I have a final question about Wave X, and then we can we talk about a handful of other things that you have come in. Um, looking back, I think the, the story of Loa and Mercury and their romantic involvement, you know, being muddled with by Legion, there was a fair amount of criticism from uh, specifically from the fact that you know is david haller meddled in that and, and kind of ruined in, in, hit, in and i know it's purposeful from your point of view si in terms of like it being about legion meddling and kind of pulling a charles xavier in some ways um but there was there was definitely a lot of criticism about you know a, a same-sex relationship uh having that sort of taint over it is that mm -hmm. something you would change uh, looking back um is there a way you would have told it differently or if you know if not that would you have changed other aspects of of way of acts at all, or are you, you know, all good with, with the way out? I mean, there's, there's granular stuff that I probably would have tweaked. Um, okay, listen, I mean, oof, this is a big one to get into here, uh, especially when I'm knackered, but um, nobody's wrong to feel the way they feel. That's the most important thing. So I'm not going to tell anybody that they are, that they got it wrong, that they misinterpreted it. It's, it's not up to me to tell them that. Um, if somebody has read something that I wrote and has been badly hurt by it, then that's on me and I'm sorry. That is, that is not my intention. Um, I'm not one of these writers who's like, oh, it's my job to challenge and offend people because no, it's not true. You, you cannot please everybody all the time, but you can try. You can, you should try, especially you should try to please the most vulnerable and persecuted sectors of your readership. So there is no question that folks who were offended by stuff I wrote deserve my apology. I take heart from the fact that those scenes um, seemed to have been taken in the spirit that I intended by, um, in particular, let's let's be more specific, by, by large sectors of the LGBTQ plus community. Lots of those folks reached out to me to say that they kind of got it and they understood that there were people who did not and were saddened and upset by the way that that scene played out um, suggests that I, I got it wrong for those people. Again, for that, I am sorry. All I can do is not make that right because i can't it's out there what i can do is explain my thinking in a way that hopefully does not forgive me but hopefully demonstrates that i wasn't being thoughtless i, I at least had some sort of chain of chain of good intention behind it <clears throat> and if it didn't work it didn't work and that's again on me but 
it is more important to me that folks know I was thinking and trying than that I was just blundering stupidly into something that I had no right to blunder into. So I believe very strongly that when people try new things in a consensual, intimate way, wonderful things happen. And I believe very strongly that things go wrong when external parties interfere. Now, the sequence that we're discussing features a straight white guy with too much power interfering in the opening stages of a shy, consensual, let's not call it romance because it didn't get that far, a shy, consensual interaction, intimacy <clears throat> between two women. And it goes wrong. It has to go wrong because he has no right and no reason to interfere in that. Um, there's also a bunch of because comics stuff going on with onslaught and, and sort of psychic negativity playing it all up and all that stuff. So there's a lot of mitigating factors. The problem, of course, is that whereas I, I think I'm right in demonstrating that the only way that I can tell stories about same-sex relationships is to demonstrate that I, a straight white man, am not the person to tell those stories. And in fact, if I try to do so, they go wrong. It was clearly something that upset folks because the net effect is of one of the few attempts, one of the few occasions that we have in comics to show a same-sex relationship ends in trauma. So what would I have done differently? I would have made sure that there were 900 other depictions of same-sex relationships in comics that did not end in trauma because that would, that would be nice. I would have made it far clearer. I mean, it's there on the page, but it, it should have been clearer that David Haller was wrong to interfere and he was being called out on it on the page. Um, there are serious repercussions for that and those will those will happen. We've seen those in, in Way of X5 and again in Onslaught Revelation, but they, they should have been flag waved more in situ. Um, I would have made damn sure that, that that comic didn't come out during Pride Week. Um, I do believe that it is important that we always depict that not every couple is compatible for deep intimacy. I don't think that you should treat every relationship in comics, whether it's straight, queer, same sex, anything. I don't think that every relationship should be treated as if it's sacrosanct. And in fact, I would go so far as to say that in this case, these two, <laughs> these two women, they probably just wanted a bit of fun. And, and to, to try and force them together in some sort of deeply profound way was the problem. That's not gonna work for everybody. But it should have been clearer that the, the crime was one of interference rather than that they were wrong or, or destined to be tortured. Um, we have very carefully, and it was always the plan, to leave the door open so that they can start again. That will be seen more in Onslaught Revelation. Um, we just sort of, yeah, we, um, we wanted to show what happens when negative forces interfere in things that aren't their business. And I stand by that. I wish that it hadn't um, been done in such a way that the, the problem appeared to be their same sexness rather than the fact that they were just two people who wanted to have intimacy and somebody else was interfering. Um, so again, I'm sorry for anybody who's offended. I do, I love that a lot of my LGBTQ plus friends have reached out to say, oh, okay, yeah, no, I get it. You know, it's, it's about interference and, and people sticking their oars in when they shouldn't. Um, but I've clearly failed to, uh, to make that message to every single reader. And, and I hate that. It, it broke my heart when I, I saw that there were some people out there who were really desperately sad about that. That's, that's not something that I ever want to do. So yeah, that's, 
that's the nature of the beast. You write comics. Um, you are going to you are going to occasionally get things wrong. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's fair. I, I think too. You know, there's a, a fair amount of readers who want to see Low and Mercury have positive relationships, right? Have more examples. And, and to that point, I think that's something that is not specific to you as a writer, but is specific to big two comics, Marvel in particular, where there aren't a ton of fantastic examples of that. And I think that's something that, that definitely down the road, you know, hopefully there's more opportunity for those two characters and, and well sure. beyond that as well. Um, cool. All right. So what, looking forward, um, what can you tell us uh, about what's to come from you? I know you have the rush coming from vault comics in October. Um, what else do you have on the radar that, that people should look forward to or, or get excited about? Oh, uh, there's various things. Not many of them I can talk about. Um, I think the rush is the only one that's actually announced. So that's uh, the, to give it its full title. This hungry earth reddens under snow clad hills. Uh, it's a, a sort of frozen north western with fantastical horror elements. I'm very proud about that. That's uh, Nathan Gooden on art. Um, I what can I talk about? I've got a couple of image projects on the go. I've got one thing with DC. Uh, and that's probably all I'm allowed to say at this point. I'm sorry. It's uh, because because of babies and because of life. Like there's a whole bunch of non-comic stuff going on as well, uh, like in in kind of TV and movie world, which your viewers won't be remotely interested in. But that takes you away a little bit. Um, is it related to um, is it related to any of your like comics properties as far as TV and movie stuff, or is it your writing gigs on other other properties? A little of both, and I, I can say no more about that, sadly. But um, cool. you, you sort of you, you take your foot off the pedal in comics six months ago, and then six months later, you just sort of disappear off the radar. <laughs> so there's there's always this weird kind of lag when it comes to visibility. But um, but yeah, uh, I'm I'm heinously busy. Uh, the the horrifying week during the opening phases of the pandemic, when all my work just went away and, and left me with nothing, seems to have healed itself over um i'd always like to do more it's it's really weird like i you know this is not the time or place to moan but i think i've become known as the guy who writes sort of weird cerebral stuff mm. in shared universes um and that's fine you know i love that i can i can do that stuff and enjoy it but i it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy you you become known as the guy who does that and nobody gives you the chance to do the, the kind of the the big dumb bold solo book with a, a superhero character who flies around fighting crime you know I quite enjoy that I think I'd be pretty good at that but um, mm. that's probably not an opportunity that anybody automatically thinks my name when they have it in front of them because I'm the guy who does <laughs> trippy psychedelic horror so <laughs> we'll mm -hmm. see I have, to, I have to keep pushing that one hmm. that's interesting yeah no it's it, by doing one thing so well Right, <laughs> you're almost pigeonholing uh, the capabilities when I'm, I'm sure that's not the case. I, I think that's why part of why I enjoy a book like a Six Gun Gorilla so much, um, or even uh, something like God Shaper, which is, I think, very high minded and, and is actually I, I found God Shaper really interesting reading in, in terms of how it connects to Way of X, um, in terms of just kind of thoughts on religion, thoughts on like developing culture. You know, kind of like you're clearly developing a language there. Um, it just it, to me, it's like a very clear template for some of the ideas in terms of how we see the youth of Krakoa having their own slang, right? That's something that came through in Way of X that I, I think we haven't seen as effectively in other books. Uh, sure. Along those like lines, like what's the work that you're proudest of you wish more people would read? Like what's the thing that you're like, man, I wish more people got into this work because I'm, I'm so proud of that. That's a really tough question to ask any, well, any writer, any creator. Your favorite child, yeah. Yeah, and it's also, it's like for me, the the favorite project is always the next one you know I, I sort of i'm always very into something while i'm working on it and then the second it's done i hate it and i i see all the things that are wrong with it uh i see the things that i could have done better um whereas the thing that i'm working on now is always full of joy and possibility and potential so i think coda is probably a, a really high watermark um and not just because i was really proud of the story and the, the kind of the thematic gristle of it all, but it, it marked the beginning of my relationship with Matthias Bagara, who's the artist on that. And he and I will, will now sort of um, collaborate on anything that we can. He's, he's 
world class in my view. I, I really can't be um, effusive enough about him. Hellblazer was, uh, it's like crushing. Uh, you get good on the comics treadmill at finding the thing that you enjoy about a project. And, and, and it's like, it's difficult to talk about this without sounding like a hack, but it is the, the skill of finding excitement in something which you wouldn't naturally be drawn to. Hmm. And I'm quite good at that, I think. But with Hellblazer, it was, it was like effortless. It was like coming home. You know, I sort of, I always knew when I started writing comics that I would end up writing Hellblazer. It's, it's a no brainer. Um, it's some of my best work. Aaron Campbell did incredible work. And then they cancelled it after 12 issues. And it, it was just like such a kind of, the numbers were okay. They weren't amazing, but it was consistently the best reviewed comic for 12 months in a row. And then they just like, yeah, never mind. <laughs> and, and now editors, <laughs> half the editors at DC won't even return my calls. I, I don't get it. I don't understand um, doing your best at something that you were born to do is clearly not enough. And I am unable to persuade the hirers and firers of the world that I could do a really good Superman or a really good Batman because they'll just want me to do more trippy psychedelic horror. Um, if this is all coming across as extremely grim and, and pessimistic, it's literally because I haven't slept in a week and I, I, uh, I, I'm dressed like a, a cut price Bono this afternoon because I keep getting migraines and, and can't stand to look at my screen anymore <laughs> without wow. getting a migraine. So, um, so yeah, it's, uh, it, it's all a bit sort of the, but I've got loads of work on. The projects I've got on are all extremely exciting projects that I will be able to enjoy and not have to work too hard to find the thing about them that I love. So, you know, it could be a lot worse. Yeah, no, I mean, small consolation, but I mean, I, I absolutely loved Hellblazer and I, I know I'm not alone in that. So you definitely have, I think the fandom of that, of John Constantine in that world, I mean, behind your back in terms of feeling uh, the pain of having not, not in the exact same way, obviously, but just of having this great run that just got canceled for like, for seemingly the smallest of reasons, whatever they might be, you know, and it definitely yeah. seems like one of those things where it says a lot more about whatever's going on with DC than it says about <laughs> the work, you know, because it's it's hard to fathom, frankly, why why that wouldn't have been a priority uh, to keep that going. So it's it's a huge bummer. I, I it's numbers, yeah. it's numbers, and it's money, and and I mean, I wrote a I wrote a very angry blog post about it, which is still out there somewhere, and and I was very clear that I don't blame anybody. It's, it's not like there's one person who made that decision. It's just that there's an algorithm somewhere that says if the numbers slip below this number, then that's it. Pull the plug. And, yeah. and that's how business gets done. It's, it's not how art gets made all the time, but it is how we fund art. So I don't, I don't hold anybody responsible. I don't bear any grudges, but it, it still breaks my heart. All right. Well, I'll, I'll hold the grudge on your behalf then because I'm, <laughs> Thank you. I'm pretty mad about it. Um, all right. So it, we, we know what's coming next for you. Some things you can't talk about. We've got Onslaught Revelation coming in September. That's going to be extremely exciting. Everybody here should definitely check that out um, if you're interested in X-Men comics. Sai, thanks so much for, for talking to me oh, and taking the time to hop on here. Yeah, I mean, this has been great. I really appreciate your candid answers and, and going in depth. Uh, where should people find you? Where should people look for you to, to hang out and, and talk and find your comics? I'm, I'm sort of doing my very best to stay off social media at the moment because it's it's sort of become a poison to me when I need to be I need to be focused on some real world stuff. So I mean I occasionally update people at Twitter. So at Cy Spurrier there, I have a website that I update the blog now and then, which is just uh, SimonSpurrier.co.uk. Um, yeah, that's that's probably the the limits of my visibility for now. I, I'm always got plans to sort of flutter a little bit stronger but um what with with life being quite lifey and work being quite worky i've i've had to sort of pare down a little bit lately yeah no that's fair a, a, a baby and a, and a small child i think we'll do that yeah <laughs> i'm astonished uh, that you are that you are stringing sentences together with a a month old and two others it's it's uh, inspiring and i'm a little jealous 
<laughs> oh yeah, well that's amazing. That's amazing to hear. But like I said, the second I leave this office, it is it is back to drooling and <laughs> laying on a couch. <laughs> so side, thanks so much for taking time. Hey everybody, thanks for joining live. I really appreciate it. Again, I'm Dave. You can find my stuff at comicbookherald.com, uh, at comicbookherald on social. And hey, if you uh, like the interview here, if you like the the content here on Crack and Krakoa, please like and subscribe to the Comic Book Herald YouTube channel. That all helps me out uh, as I continue to talk all things X-Men. So we're going to end the live stream here. Again, thanks everybody for joining. Thank you, Sai, so much. And uh, we'll talk to you later.